everyone, and welcome to episode 80 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. When we look back, it's usually possible for people even slightly in the know to name the kings of a certain country. Often it's princes, maybe a bit less often it's queens, but how many of us can name a kingdom's princesses? It's really easy to follow in the footsteps of medieval chroniclers and to think of a princess's worth or her life solely in terms of the marriage market, or perhaps to believe that their lives are unknowable to us. But as it turns out, sometimes we can get a fairly clear picture of a princess, or five, and get to know them as the people they were. And what lies behind dry lists of goods procured might just be some of the most memorable and powerful people of their generation. Dr. Kelsey Wilson-Lee is the head of programs at England's Architectural Heritage Fund and the author of several articles appearing in places like BBC History magazine. She's also the author of Daughters of Chivalry, The Forgotten Children of Edward I. I invited Kelsey to come on the podcast to tell us about these five forgotten daughters and why each of them is actually unforgettable in her own right. Here's our conversation about life as a real medieval princess, and why Edward's daughters wouldn't have recognized themselves in the typical fairy tale role. Thanks for joining me, Kelsey, to talk about the daughters of chivalry. These are Edward the First's daughters. I'm so happy to have you on the podcast, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you, and I enjoyed the book, so I'm excited to start talking about this. So, I think we should start at the beginning. For the people who don't know, who is Edward the First? So, Edward the First is in North America off remembered as Longshanks, largely through a certain Mel Gibson film, which will remain nameless. Uh, but Edward I was a king who came to power in 1272 and had a surprisingly long reign, not quite as long as his father, but still pretty long. He, he died in 1307. So during this time, he is well remembered for having, he successfully invaded and conquered Wales, subdued Wales, he tried and never was successful in, in conquering Scotland. He is remembered as the Hammer of the Scots. He tried to go to war against France. He was quite a military-minded king, also quite a successful administrator. He's remembered mostly for his many and very expensive wars, but he was, he was a kind of ideal medieval king, not necessarily a nice man in the way we would think of an ideal person now, but he embodied kind of the model of kingship where being a warrior, he was a crusader king, the only crusader king of his generation. He was a, a very pious man, so he kind of embodied a lot of these ideals. I tend to think of Edward I as a great king and probably not necessarily a great guy, if, that, <laughs> if, that, if one can be allowed that juxtaposition. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, he's been described as a great and terrible king, right? And that ended up being the title of Mark Morris's biography of him. That's right. Yeah. And I think that you can't you can't really look at him without seeing that complication of his being in some ways a great king but also not a very nice person especially uh, if you're Welsh or Scottish, right? Or Jewish. Or uh, Jewish, he, yeah. He, he expelled the the Jews from England. Yeah, I, the, he has certainly very many uh, significant flaws from our vantage point. But interestingly, uh, something that he wouldn't necessarily have been given a lot of credit for by contemporaries, but to us might make him slightly more sympathetic, is he had a close family relationship with not only his, his wife, he famously had a very close relationship with his wife, was famously loyal to her, uh, which was quite rare, and also had this very intense relationship with his, his daughters slightly more troubling relationship with his son who you know well, we can talk about that in a bit but he had kind of a gentler more I guess you know easygoing uh, what we would think of as a kind of natural paternal child relationship with his daughters than many many other kings at, at the time did yeah absolutely it's almost as you say surprising almost startling how much of a family man he was while at mm. the same time being an absolutely ruthless king in yeah. other ways. Okay, so let's get into that. So Edward married his wife, Eleanor, when they were teenagers, right? So what, how did that go? So yeah, so they got, they were married in the 12, 1250s at Eleanor of Castile, a Castilian princess who came over from, from Spain to, to marry Edward. They were almost 
he was a couple years older than her. They were both teenagers and they had a, there was a, their early years were very intense because the, that was kind of the, this was the period leading up to the baronial rebellion and, and under, you know, Simon de Montfort and Edward father, Henry III, very nearly lost the throne during this time. And, and this was the time of Edward and Eleanor's kind of early marriage. So I think the intensity possibly of these, these early years really kind of bonded them together. They stayed famously together throughout their many decades of marriage. They were constantly traveling, constantly traveling, both from place to place, town to town within, within England, but also much farther afield. They went together, not just to Wales, to France, to kind of visit parts of her patrimony in, in northern France and places in Gascony, which were at that point held by the English. But also they went as far as on crusade together. They went to the Holy Land and Eleanor came with him everywhere. As indeed her own mother had traveled with her father when he had been on military campaign. So it was clearly, it was a, a model Eleanor had picked up from her own mother. And it was one that her daughters would go on to emulate as well. Yeah. And I think, I think we should get into how they traveled together as a whole family in a couple of minutes. But okay, so we've got Edward, we've got Eleanor, they're married. And they have, mm. I think Eleanor had 16 pregnancies, like a huge a lot amount. of kids. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> Feel deeply sympathetic for Eleanor. Right. Throughout. All this traveling while pregnant. Wow. What a woman. Traveling on horseback while pregnant, you know, um, constantly. And she, she also kept hunting through all of her pregnancies. She was a, a keen huntress. But yes, yeah, so they had lots of children. And one of the kind of deeply upsetting things that you have to get past quite quickly is that almost, you know, the majority of those children did not make it past early childhood, you know, and this is, this is the king and queen, you know, these are not people without resource, these are not people without access to the best nutrition and medical advice that existed within that time. And yet, Eleanor's 15, 16 pregnancies only six children survived past, you know, past the age of 10. And, and that, this is an issue of a lot of debate about to what extent do, were people impacted, were parents impacted by those deaths of children? And, you know, we can have different perspectives and we can argue different sides of that. But certainly, I would imagine it would be affecting if it is affecting people as much as we would be is a, a different question. But it certainly, it wouldn't have been easy. So they have all these different children and five daughters and one son end up surviving. And the son, the one son that ends up surviving is their very last child, the last of all of them. So he's got five older sisters and the five older sisters were the subject of my book. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that's important that you've obviously mentioned in the book that's important for people to recognize is throughout the life, especially of their oldest daughter who's named Eleonora, she's always the third in line to the throne. And when mm -hmm. you think about it, I mean, so often, especially with daughters, princesses, they're shunted to the side. But you have to recognize when you're looking at Eleonora's life that she was always in some way an heir to the throne, first with her brother Alfonso and then her brother yeah. Edward. So can you talk a little bit about what that would have been like for Eleonora being raised as kind of an heir to the throne? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really interesting when you look at the way these five, when you have five princesses in one generation, which is quite rare in the medieval period, most people didn't have that many kids who survived. But when you have that many, you can really see how they are treated differently depending on their birth order. And Eleonora, from an early age, as you were saying, she's, there's always a kind of a little sickly boy standing between her and the throne. <laughs> yeah. um, there are a succession of little boys who are around for a few years and, and then and then don't don't survive. Edward, the one who ended up becoming uh, her, her her brother, who ended up becoming Edward the Second, Prince Edward. He's many many years younger. She was a, a teenager before he was born. So throughout much of her childhood, she is very much treated as the kind of I suppose the the spare within the heir and the spare. You know, she's the extra one. Obviously not ideal being a female, but her father does take steps legal steps to ensure that if if he dies without a male heir that she herself will become the heir of the throne i mean obviously within a primogeniture situation which is what we have the transition of of land and estates 
through the male line. Generally, if you are a nobleman and you don't have any sons and you have a series of daughters, your estate will be divided up equally between those, those female heirs. You can't do that if you have a kingdom at stake. So uh, Edward does take steps to ensure that Eleanor's rights as the heir are protected. And he also is clearly, there's a little hint here and there where he's clearly educating her more about statecraft. She is participating in signing charters in her own name at the age of about 12. This is one of the wonderful charter where she agrees that she kind of licenses her father's ambassadors to go act on her behalf to help arrange a, a marriage for her that doesn't end up coming off, but would have made her queen of Aragon. And it's quite rare to see a 12-year-old female signing these charters in her own name. And it, it's, in, it's in her voice. Nevertheless, obviously, quite a formal charter, you know, the charter is a very formal language, but she speaks, you know, about herself giving this permission. So you get the sense that Eleanor is designed, she's being trained to be a prince. And you don't get that with her younger siblings, her younger sisters who were never in that same position. Yeah, they all have kind of a different role. But thinking of Eleanor as being trained as a prince, I think that's a good way of thinking of it. When her parents are in the country, Eleanor is going with them pretty much everywhere. She's going into like hostile territory in Wales. She's learning about how to do things. And as you say, she has a lot of agency in that she's trying things out by herself as an administrator, which I think is really, as, as you had said, is rare. And also a very interesting thing to look at and something that we don't look at a lot when we look at princesses. No, it's, that's right. And, you know, of course, all women were trained to be able to administer estates, noble women. You know, we haven't, they need it to be because as Eleanor finds out later in her life, when many, many years later, her husband, and she's off living in, in northern France, and her husband is captured and is held hostage. And she, you know, the administration of the county that she's in falls to her. You know, she is responsible legally for looking after this county on behalf of her husband who can't do it because he's, he's being held hostage. So it is something that there is a, an awareness within medieval culture that women, noble women, might be in this position where they need to act as an administrator of, of an estate. They need to have enough knowledge about how to do that, that they're not going to, if they're in that position, they're not going to kind of let everything fall apart. So they, they need to, women kind of were trained and, and taught to be able to do that. But she, she was tra trained and taught to be able to do it at the level of a kingdom, if, if need be. And I think she comes across a very much, very serious, quite dutiful individual. Yes. And there are so many records that kind of get at her as a person, that there's one mm. point at which you say, you know, she dies and there's not even a ripple you know people almost yeah. don't mention it in the records and you mentioned that it's surprising and you said it's strangely painful and I really did feel that you know you get to know Eleanor through the records of what she asks for what she does how she uses her influence with her father which she mm -hmm. does very responsibly as you say she's a perfect daughter and then she just disappears and it is painful <laughs> yeah it is disappear. it is and I think it really it shows the difference of the way that women are treated in different kinds of historical sources. So where we get the notices about the death of kings is is in chronicles. You know, we get kind of the king died and this was horrible and you know, these things happened. And where we get information about these women is from kind of um receipts of of things that they've they've bought or they've purchased or, you know, rare surviving letters and charters and things like that where we get this kind of detail about the women that fleshes them out and makes them seem like real people, they are almost, these women are almost completely absent from these great chronicle sources that tell us about the deaths of kings, right? So we don't know about their deaths because the sources that would tell us that are uninterested in these women. They're really the only thing they normally tell us about these women. The really basically the only time they normally show up is when they marry some other important man. You know, and at that point, they are simply the the women are serving as the the bridge between England and and this other this other kind of kingdom or, or whatever the area is. Yeah. So it's why you have to look for different sources if you're interested in women. Yeah, 
And I think that that brings me to one of the other sisters. I'm not going in birth order here, but like one of the pictures that you have in here is a genealogical chart of Edward's daughters. And it doesn't even mention Mary, who nope. because she has become a nun, she's not getting married. But boy, is Mary in the receipts, <laughs> right? She sure is. Yeah, no, I think. Mary, yes, if you were strictly looking at this wonderful genealogical chart, and it has, you know, Edward, and it has Eleanor of Castile, and then it's got little pictures. They are almost contemporary, not quite contemporary, but they're little pen drawings of, of women's faces. And you think, wow, and yet you look at this, and if, you, if that was your key source, you would say Edward and Eleanor had four daughters, because Mary is completely not there at all. <laughs> Uninteresting to the genealogist, because she didn't procreate. But yes, you're right. If you look in the, uh, the receipts and the records of bills paid off and gambling debts paid <laughs> off, you will find plenty of Mary. Yes. <laughs> she, she's a, she was, Mary is everyone's favorite body nun. You know, she, uh, un, for all that, you know, the idea of a nun was a kind of, you know, very pious vow, you know, thinking of vows of poverty and simple living. Mary is none of that. Mary is flamboyant and, you know, fairly outlandish at times. And certainly she lived her best life, I think is what I can say. <laughs> yeah, she went into so much debt at some point. That I think you said her goldsmith went to debtor's prison. Because... Her goldsmith was, was, <laughs> had to be, yes, her father had to pay off her debt to the goldsmith to get him released from debtor's prison. I mean, that's a lot of bling, isn't it? So, yes, for, for a nun, um, imagine <laughs> underneath the, the robes what must have been there. But yes. Mary is, she's definitely a character for sure. She's not somebody who, you know, you would think of as the dutiful daughter. But at the same time, Edward, who's this very stern king, is just indulging her. He just pays for it and pays for it and pays for it. And Mary gets invited to all the parties and they sure. visit her at the Abbey too. So. This kind of, to me, it speaks to their familial relationship. Like they're actually going out of their way to visit her. Yes. I mean, they are, they are a close family. I, I think Edward had a lot of guilt that he put Mary in the convent. So Mary went into the convent at the age of six, yeah. which was not really supposed to happen. And she, she joined the convent in order to be a companion to her grandmother. It was her grandmother who, after living a life at court, Eleanor of Provence, her, her grandmother wanted to retire to become a nun but didn't want to give up all of her grandchildren. So took a couple of them with her. Mm -hmm. um, and Mary's mother, Eleanor of Castile, was not happy about the fact that her daughter was being consigned to a convent at the age of six. She tried to protest, was not successful. But I think that a lot of, a lot of Edward's kind of uh, indulgence of Mary later on can probably, I mean, I would argue, could potentially be at least traced back to guilt. I guess one of the things I think is very interesting about Mary is a lot of the kind of flamboyance can look very, it strikes us as, as inappropriate for a nun, as unusual, sure, we can, and we can kind of, you know, to a certain extent, we can kind of laugh about it. But I think some of what she was doing was demonstrating her connection to court when she travels, when she has a, a very lavish table she's demonstrating that that you know she's she's the daughter of the king and that buys her a certain amount of power whereas all of her sisters all had positions as daughters of the king but also connected to their husbands they were they were countesses they were duchesses one of them was in her own right one of the greatest landowners in britain after her first husband's death mary had no connection that gave her power other than the connection to her father and I think that some of the, the flamboyance could actually have been that, her trying to demonstrate that connection, which gave her the additional kind of access to power. Yeah, I have a lot of sympathy for Mary. I mean, you do have to laugh at the, just the sheer extravagance when you compare it to the lifestyle she was supposed to be living. But, but yeah, I do have a lot of sympathy for her. And I think you're right in that a lot of Edward's actions, I think, could be explained by kind of paternal guilt because mm -hmm. Margaret and Elizabeth both really dig their heels in about being shipped off to be yeah. married. And yeah. he kind of, he's not happy about it. I think he throws Margaret's yeah. crown in the fire, right? But he's not Elizabeth. happy about yeah, it. Yeah. It's Elizabeth's? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But he, he allows it to a point. And I think that's because 
he has a relationship with them as people and it's got to be hard for them you know to have your daughter begging to not be sent over to a different country you know yeah yeah and I think you know we we sometimes you know think of these things as, as women going off to marry some some guy they don't know and I'm sure there was lots of that but actually in this case These were women being sent off to marry some guy they did know quite well because he'd been living at the English court. And maybe they knew they didn't like him much. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot that's quite easy to sympathize with. But one of the things I find very interesting about this is ultimately, you know, everybody, even when Edward was able to kind of give them the kind of, you know, stay of execution to a certain extent, Margaret got married and still stayed in England for another another five years. Elizabeth had a, a kind of year-long sabbatical away from her her new husband but eventually they did need they needed to go they needed to go because you know England needed them to go be the representative of the connection in both of their cases both Elizabeth and Margaret married into powers that were very important for the English wool trade and when the economy of England is you know heavily dependent on wool and your father is running a bunch of very expensive wars and needs to keep the money coming in, and you have the ability to do something about that, you, the individual princess, I find it quite interesting that they all actually ultimately, despite their clear personal preference not to, they went off and did did the dutiful thing. And I, I think you can see within that them playing an important role that goes beyond being a pawn. They are actually an active participant in England's diplomatic maneuvering on a kind of European stage. I find that is a useful and I think much more active way to think about these marriages rather than thinking about these women as mere pawns of their father. Yeah, exactly. They did not want to go. They did dig their heels in, but eventually they did go. Yeah. And they did what they were supposed to do, what they were trained to do, what they were asked to do as well. So yeah. And and actually, you know, what they were ultimately, yeah, what they were trying to do. And, and, and actually, they were, many of them were very successful. Margaret did not have a great relationship with her husband. At no point did their relationship dramatically improve. But she was actually quite, turned it, she matured as she grew up into quite a, quite a decent diplomat. You know, we see her negotiating trade deals between uh, her, her duchy in Brabant and Brussels and England well into her married life. And that shows the kind of that there is a there is a role. It's not just get married, have kids. That's it. You know, you actually there was a the role of the the consort was a a, a political role that that had kind of continuing presence and importance yeah. for both both sides, both yeah. countries. Speaking of important political roles, that brings us to Joanna, the second ah. oldest. <laughs> Joanna is probably the most colorful of all of them. <laughs> like when you think of like sheer. Uh, guts, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so tell us a little oh, bit yeah. about, uh, yeah, exactly, about Joanna. Joanna is most people's favorite. She's quite bold, maybe a little brash. She's just a bit different from all the rest of them from the beginning. And I, I think that it's, she, she did not know any of her other siblings until she was six. She lived for slightly complex reasons. She lived at her, her grandmother's court in northern France for her earliest years. And there is just a kind of independent streak that in Joanna that is never, never um, washes out. <laughs> uh, she is married, uh, but the most kind of stereotypical in your mind pawn, you know, princess is a pawn marriage of any of these daughters is Joanna's first marriage. She is married at the age of 15 to one of her father's most powerful, but also most difficult subjects. Gilbert de Clare, who is a very important martyr lord. All of Glamorgan has vast counties throughout England. And he is about 40, vastly older than her, already married, has some kids whom he disinherited to marry Joanna. Very complex. But what's really interesting about Joanna is when Gilbert de Clare dies, she has four children. She is about 23, 24 years old. And suddenly she is the sole landowner of one of the largest estates in Britain, including vast amounts of the, this land in, in, in Wales and the Welsh marches, which is particularly important because the jurisdiction of the, the march 
meant that within Wales, within Glamorgan, she basically was kind of, you know, almost like a queen in her own area. She had, uh, there was much less oversight on behalf of that her father had. But she has this wonderful situation where she's suddenly one of her father's most important lords. And then their relationship kind of changes overnight from her being his daughter, her, his quite slightly headstrong daughter, <laughs> to suddenly being one of his kind of vassals, you know, his feudal vassals. Yeah, I mean, it would be it'd be wonderful to say. And she settled down very nicely into her <laughs> into her kind of role. She she absolutely did not. She continued to give her father all kinds of difficulty, eloping with a, a nobody who she nearly lost everything out of uh, marrying this young man who who seems to have come completely from nowhere. But ultimately, she she wins her father around and she gets to hold her estate and remain married to this this man who is it's clearly a love match and she wins her father around because actually she knows him and she knows how to appeal to him in a way that will work and she's quite savvy you know she's she's definitely not an easygoing person i don't know that joanna would have been a great friend um <laughs> <No>. but she's <laughs> she comes across as very determined and certainly very one of those people who they're just going to make sure it, you know, they're just going to get it done, you know, and I'm from the American South and there's a phrase come hell or high water <laughs> um, that, that we, we, we use. And, and that's kind of reminds me of Joanna. I think she was just, she was going to do what she was going to do and gosh, you better not get in her way. Yeah. Um, but yeah. happily it did work out for her. Yeah. <laughs> eventually. I think, I think I would rather be friends with Eleonora for sure. But like reading <laughs> of Joanna's story is amazing. So she marries Ralph. She gets him knighted to try and elevate him a little bit. But of course, as soon as her father finds out, you know, she, he jails her husband and stuff. And yeah. She still manages she to stand up to him. Jails the new husband, confiscates all the lands, takes your children into, uh, takes her existing children uh, into custody. Yeah, but she she goes and finds him and pleads with him and gets away with it in the end. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's interesting to think. I, I guess I would say Eleanor would be a, a really interesting friend. Mary would have thrown the best parties. <laughs> um, Joanna, you know, if you if you had a difficult thing that needed to get done, she'd be the one to see it through. And and Elizabeth, who we haven't talked about that much, but really, as it always strikes me as a quite a sentimental person. There's a kind of niceness, an inherent goodness to Elizabeth that, that comes across quite well. She was very, very attached to her family. Mm -hmm. And that, that comes across. She kind of, even as an adult, largely lives within her father's court and, and is very close with him, even as an adult. So I think they, they each have these kind of different personalities. And I, yes, I tend to think of them in my mind. You know, the five sisters, it's, it's not unlike you know, in Pride and Prejudice, so you've got the, the five Bennett girls with the different personalities. I, I tend to think of these these as a, a kind of a pack in that way. Yeah, yeah, and the way they, they treat each other. And there's such sibling things that happen in here. You know, I think it's mm -hmm. easy to forget when you look at people that are so far in the past or people who are so elevated in their position to not think of them as siblings. But yeah. there is this moment where, and I've you know, I, I like looking into English history, I like looking into this era. And uh, I think many of us know about the moment where Edward I, he throws out Pierce Gaveston. He gets very angry at his son, Edward, and strips him of everything. Basically, you're grounded. But I yeah. didn't realize that at that moment, like, Joanna gives her little brother her seal and is like, it's fine. Like, I'll sneak you out the back. You can spend whatever money you want. Like, what? That is such it's, a sibling thing to do, you know? <laughs> it is. It, it was a big sister being like, don't worry, I'll sort it out. I'll, I'll calm dad down. You know, it, I have to say that moment where, where Joanna sends her brother his seal, which was just, I, I almost kind of, you know, was gobsmacked. It's a kind of gesture. of It was quite breathtaking bravado. Yeah. Nobody else could have gotten away with it. Anyone else would have gotten in huge amounts of trouble from, from Edward. Yeah, but, exactly. but, you know, the, the idea, even her brother, even Prince Edward, you know, immediately kind of disavows <laughs> the action. It's like, I, I, I promised dad I didn't ask for her seal. Here, have the seal back, you know. But it's, exactly. a, it's a wonderful thing. And, and of course, you know, 
I mean, it's it, the seal is this is this is his his um, Edward the King is trying to make his son uh, is trying to bring him to heal and to control him by controlling his spending power. And if he can't spend, if he can't doesn't have any money, he has to kind of you know shape up and and do what his dad says. But yes, his sister then hands him the equivalent of a Black American Express and says, "Go have fun." <laughs> Um, it's an astonishingly provocative act, actually. And I, yeah, I just, nobody else, I don't think, could have gotten away with it. <laughs> no, I know. And he, like, Edward, the father, he lets her get away with it eventually. I mean, he's mm -hmm. pretty angry, but like, I mean, I think at that point, you got to expect that kind of stunt from Joanna. But it's, it's almost stunning to me that that never makes it into the stories of the relationship between the two men. Joanna's yeah. part in it is erased when really this would have been a huge moment for the family. Like this would have been an awkward Christmas gathering, you know, after that. So it's quite I think a big they had deal. a couple of awkward Christmas gatherings. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think one of the most shocking things for me when I started working on the research for this book was I am a historian of, of late medieval England and I, you know, I'm particularly interested in the 13th, 14th centuries. This is my period. This is my 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 area. And I did not know these stories before I started this project. I did not really. I I kind of had a vague notion there were some girls in the in the family, but yeah. I didn't know about them. And I didn't I didn't know that. I also was completely. I had this, I guess, kind of um, intuitive feeling that there wasn't that much to be known. That there weren't any records. And and they, maybe they maybe they were interesting, but we would never know. And we couldn't know. And therefore, it was very, very in, uh, enlightening for me when I kind of started working with the wardrobe accounts that actually, they're just all over the place in these accounts. And you can piece them together bit by bit. And it's quite painstaking, but you can you can get there and, and actually tell a quite, quite compelling narrative about them. And you can really, you can really get to kind of know them as people. Yeah. In the last episode of the podcast, I was talking to Jack Hartnell about, you know, objects can tell us a lot about how they were used in society and things like that mm. and it's almost the same thing where you can construct reconstruct relationships in a way by looking at objects by looking at these receipts and i think it's very valuable because as you say I, like i knew that there were some girls i knew that there were a lot mm. of kids and there's always one line edward was a pretty decent family man and that's all you get and so i was surprised yeah. at how much information you could get out of this so if we can take one thing away yeah. from this book, what would you say we need to take away from this book and the lessons you've learned or the people that you've learned about from writing this? What should we take away from this? Be careful about the way that we as historians sometimes project our assumptions about what these people would have been like or what knowledge we might be able to gain about them into the past. So in this case, you know, finding the right source, and it's not always there, but sometimes it's there. You might be able to find out more than you think, and you might end up finding, I certainly didn't expect to find somebody like Joanna. You know, I certainly didn't expect to encounter somebody who was quite that bold, and yet there she is. You know, it would have been, it would have been if I had just written this story as these poor, simple pawns, how sad for them. <laughs> that actually would not have been true to who they were. It would have been projecting my image of them back onto the historic past. So one of the concerns I often have about when I read even contemporary historians talking about medieval women in the past, I find we often project our assumptions that they were, they were victimized onto them. So I, I encountered something, I was reading, I'm doing, I'm researching something else at the minute, and a historian kept referring to a, the, the shield of arms, the heraldic arms that were for that woman's family as her father's arms. So there was her husband's arms and her father's arms. And I just, I think that she would have thought those were her arms, yeah. you know, those her family's arms. But the historians were saying, it's her father's arms and her arms and how sad that she's had to put these, sorry, her husband's arms, her father's arms. She's had to identify herself with these male symbols. Why do we think they thought those were male symbols? Why do we not think they thought those were family symbols and that they would see themselves in that? I mean, I see these women 
in terms of you want to look at objects, there are, there are a small number of objects that are associated with these women. They have heraldic insignia of England on them because I think these women felt ownership of that heraldic insignia, not because they thought it was their father's, but because they thought it was theirs. And I think that they perceived a role for themselves in this kind of machinery of court. You notice when I talked about that not just being a pawn and going out and, and being married off to somebody, but actually having an active role where you are going from England off to be somewhere for the good of England, and you're doing that actively, and you're performing that role with your life. And I think that it doesn't a great injustice to people to say, to, to ignore the activeness of that role and to say it was a purely passive one. Yeah. I think that, that was much more long winded, but maybe you can do something with it. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm going to leave that there. I think that you really have said it in a good way in that these people were not passive in their own lives. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, your, your book and what we said today really illustrates that, that they are active participants in their own lives. You only get one life. They were living their lives, especially Mary. Yeah, especially Mary. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this. I really enjoyed the book. And I think that you've kind of shown us a, a way of getting at women that maybe maybe is not conventional or hasn't been conventional. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thanks for coming Thanks. to talk to us. Nice to, nice to speak with you, Danielle. Kelsey's book is called Daughters of Chivalry, The Forgotten Children of Edward I, and it's now available everywhere you find great books. To find out more about Kelsey and her work, you can visit her website, kelseywilsonlee.com. That's K E L. C E Y Wilson Lee dot com. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, we have a very special piece of this week. It's by Terry Barnes, and he's been in Iceland over the last few weeks, and he's been looking at how the island's medieval past affects its present day. So it's a really interesting piece, and it looks like Terry interviewed some like really fun people, interesting people there. And uh, yeah, so I, I recommend that. And we've also started a new series called In Search of the Once and Future King, which is James Turner looking at the changing character of King Arthur. So going all the way from the 13th century all the way to the 20th. So uh, we have that. And let's not forget your latest piece. Yeah, on stain Maybe? removal. Yes. So when we don't have like laundry <laughs> detergent. Yeah, this is what we need. How so. to remove stains. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited about this one, especially the steam cleaning one. So everyone should check that out and then read the original article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all that's all on this week on the website. And uh, yeah, and uh, please, uh, if you're looking to sponsor us on Patreon, we have uh, a, the, our book of the month. It takes you back to third century uh, China. And our next map is going to be on medieval London. So uh, that and much more. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to our patrons on Patreon.com for all your support each and every month. Whether you're in it for the subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine, the Medieval magazine, our book club, our exclusive Medieval maps, or just because you're awesome, I really appreciate it. If you haven't checked out all our amazing rewards yet, you can find them all at Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For everything from princesses to medieval steam cleaning, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at all your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an unforgettable day.